Um, very warm welcome to this taster lecture for postgraduate programmes in the School of Finance and Management at SOAS University of London. I am Christine Out and I'm one of the professors in the School of Finance and Management and I'm here tonight with my colleague Dr Alberto Asper who's a senior lecturer in public policy and management in the School of Finance and Management. And we're just going to give you a little overview of the four programmes, postgraduate programmes that we have on campus. And then Alberto is going to give a, a short taster lecture so you get a flavour of the kinds of uh, things we cover in our lectures and our style of teaching at SOAS. So um, moving on to this next slide, um, we can see that SOAS, if you're not familiar with it, is located in a brilliant location actually, I'm always very happy to go into work at SOAS. It's right next to the British Museum and Russell Square in the centre of London. Um, and the picture you're seeing at the bottom is Senate House, where SOAS has one half of Senate House, which is um, the old um, building of the University of London. So you probably know University of London is a federal structure. The SOAS, UCL, LSE are all members of the same um, university, University of London. And this is the headquarters, if you like, of University of London. So it's a fantastic location, close to the city of London close to all the main connections for rail and so on. And uh, it's, uh, I am a Londoner, I'm very proud to be a Londoner. And one of the things I love about London is it's a very cosmopolitan city where people meet from all over the world. So moving on to the next slide, a little bit about the School of Finance and Management at, at SOAS. We are ranked first for business and management studies in London and 14th in the UK in the 2020 Guardian League table you can have a look at. There's a, a survey every year um, from the National Student Survey that show that 96% of our students are satisfied with the overall quality of their course. Um, we are ranked in the top 20 on research intensity in the UK Research Excellent Framework. We have accreditation for our undergraduate ACCA and SEMA programs, and we collaborate with a number of institutions um, across the world, Europe, North America, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, so we'd like to see ourselves as positioned globally. Here's a brief story from one of our students. It says, it's only at SOAS where you'd find that your Jamaican friends enjoying um, listening to Arabic music in the students' union. And it gives a flavor of how cosmopolitan SOAS is as a university. And, and that's one of the things I think we all love about SOAS. It's very international. Um, and if we look at the careers of our graduates, these are some of the places where recent graduates are currently working. Um, Boston Consulting Group, Saatchi and Saatchi, Bloomberg, the UK um, Government Treasury, the Government of Canada, Santander, Kleinwalt Benson, Euromonitor International, UBS and so on. So our graduates, um, are very successful at going on to prestigious careers and also to do research. A number of them go on to do PhDs at top universities, including some of them stay with us at SOAS for their PhD. Um, what a little bit about the way we teach and structure our programs. Our programs degrees, they're research led and they're challenge driven programs. That's very important to us. So you're taught by people who are actually doing the research. Um, and our postgraduate students are well equipped in research methods and all of the skills necessary for a strong career start in um, a fairly advanced level at the range of organizations in the public and the private sectors. And the style of education we offer is small group. It's a personalized style of education. So you would be in small group tutorials, which gives you an opportunity to develop um, skills at discussing, debating, communicating ideas, and discussing quite fairly complex research issues and breaking those problems down, um, led by a lecturer or professor in those tutorials. So it's a nice conducive environment for developing good working relations with fellow students, with staff, and we also have good links with um, company executives and uh, uh, colleagues that we work quite closely with in, um, in the real world, as it were, in banks, in the banking sector, um, and in industry. We have help, we can give help with internships and finding placements at companies. And if we move on to the next slide, we have four postgraduate programs at SOAS. 
one MSc in accounting and finance, an international financial management MSc, an MSc in international business, an MSc in public policy, finance and management. I'm going to hand over to my colleague now, who will explain a little bit about the structure of these programmes. So over to you, Alberto. Thank you, Christine, and welcome to all the participants and anyone who will listen or watch this, uh, uh, this webinar. Uh, just a few words concerning uh, uh, these MSc programs. They all share a uh, common structure. And so that's the easy part because every MSc program consists of uh, eight modules. Uh, students take uh, over two terms uh, plus a dissertation. And uh, for each term, uh, students uh, take uh, three core uh, compulsory modules and they have a choice of one extra elective modules. This is a common structure running across the four MSc programs. Any particular program, then uh, they do have uh, specific features uh, about uh, what, is, uh, what is taught in these, uh, in these programs. So the MSc, Accounting and Finance, uh, is really intended to help uh, students uh, build uh, deeper expertise on uh, accounting and finance matters. You can have a quick look at the titles of the modules which are taught there, and you can notice uh, uh, topics like uh, uh, professional integrity and accountancy for finance practitioner, managerial accounting, risk management, uh, financial, anal financial statement analysis for investors, and emerging market finance. You may also notice the in term two uh, course uh, which is on research methods in management and that's there as in any uh, as, a, as in other MSc programs because the research uh, is a key component part uh, of our postgraduate degrees apart from the expertise in any particular subject area uh, postgraduate students uh, they do become uh, expert uh, to carry out research uh, to carry out research independently as they can demonstrate uh, in the in the dissertation project therefore um, all of the subjects which they learn but also specific specifically the, the topic on the research methods in management does provide the students a, a way to uh, develop their skills and knowledge uh, on research methods, how to design research, qualitative and quantitative skills, uh, both data collection, data analysis and interpretation down to the very final uh, skills and capabilities needed to write professionally uh, research reports or, or policy papers. So that's again another general feature of uh, MSc programs, which is of course uh, also included in the MSc accounting, uh, accounting and finance. This program, as a highlight, is accredited by SIMA and uh, enables you into SIMA Masters Gateway with uh, some, uh, some exemptions. Uh, other, other programs, uh, uh, they do provide a specialized expertise in different, uh, different areas. Uh, Christine, please let me know if uh, this fine uh, provides a general overview or uh, you'd like to step in uh, to, to, to supplement uh, any additional highlights uh, you, you regard as uh, quite important. The MSc International Financial Management, uh, again, does provide uh, a, a way to gain expertise uh, on uh, financial matters. You can see the compulsory modules uh, like financial modeling techniques, financial law for international managers and risk management, international corporate finance, financial statement analysis for investors and emerging market, uh, market finance. Let me just comment uh, here that uh, uh, with, in relation to the very international feature of, of SOAS, uh, these, uh, these programs, uh, they do nicely combine uh, attention to many institutions and practices and policies uh, all over the world. So generally, they do pay attention to both uh, industrialized or emerging uh, economies from every region of the world, and typically modules uh, students take are enriched by examples and case studies which may be taken from, uh, from several, several countries, which opens up uh, very interesting opportunities also for uh, comparison across institutions and practices and trajectories uh, of development across uh, across countries and markets. Another program is the one on, in on international business and you can see from the compulsory modules uh, the, the flavor of, of this program. So we have international management, international human resource management and international marketing international business strategy, multinationals and global business uh, together with the research methods in, in management. Uh, uh, the department uh, is called the School of Finance and Management precisely because it does combine nicely focus on both uh, finance, uh, management of the financial resource and financial institutions together with an interest towards managing the human resource. And there, I should say, with a, a keen interest towards the variety of uh, practices which are encountered 
around, uh, across the globe, also depending on a specific culture, culture features. And the last program I'd like to spend a couple of words uh, is the one which I convene, the MSC Public Policy Finance and Management, which is uh, uh, focused uh, on public sector management. It does uh, bring together three different components of looking at public policy, public management and uh, public financial management. And so modules they do include attention on uh, uh, fiscal governance, on public governance, on general features of uh, making and implementing uh, public policy together with other topics like innovation and organizational change and emerging market finance. This is a general overview of uh, what we uh, touch upon what we cover in these programs. I'd like to ask uh, Christine if you'd like to uh, share any other particular highlight. Otherwise, I believe that's the point where we can provide a taste to, to our prospective students with a little bit of insight into uh, what we teach uh, by providing uh, a bit of an example with another part of the presentation. Thank you, Alberto. I mean, you've done a great job, so I don't really have very much to add except to say that, you know, it's so as one of the distinctive features that we have is that we have an, an understanding, a deep understanding across SOAS of finance and management in different areas of the world. Um, and we see the world as interconnected in that way. And we learn a lot from different areas of the world. And just to give you an example of that and why that's important um, is that there is a technique of supply side management, for example, that you're probably familiar with called um, uh, just in time and it manages a supply chain instead of storing all of the components to make goods, it manages the supply chain. So everything arrives just in time um, to go into the manufacturing process. And that form of supply chain management is incredibly efficient, but it wasn't created here. There are many, many articles published on just-in-time management and why it's so effective. And it's been theorized and understood and broken down so that it can be applied in different contexts. And that theorizing is incredibly important, but of course it came from Japan. Um, it wasn't something created in the West. It's something that the West borrowed from um, Japanese companies and learned from. And there's that scope for learning across cultures and languages is, is an incredibly important feature of the work we do. So we're, we're probably more international than a standard school of finance and, and management or standard um, business school. We're very open and we kind of celebrate that internationalism. So I think that's all I would add, Alberto, and leave it to you to give us a taste of um, public policy, finance and management. Thank you, Christine. And I thought to share with the participants uh, just uh, some slides and a brief talk uh, concerning uh, a topic which uh, I, we discussed uh, with, the, with the students in the last uh, term uh, within the public governance uh, uh, module concerning uh, a particular aspect of public governance, which is uh, regulation, regulatory policies, and we focused on regulation of uh, emerging uh, technologies. Uh, let me try and uh, uh, share with you uh, another, another presentation. I think I needed to stop sharing this one. Okay, and to launch a new, a new share of the screen instead. And uh, here it is. Um, can you can you confirm? Uh, do you see another another presentation now? Yeah, yes, Alberto, that's great. Perfect. Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. Just very quickly uh, to to provide a, a taste uh, of what has been covered uh, uh, this year, and to, it will be also in uh, in uh, in next year. Is is an attention within uh, within the governance uh, concerning regulation and regulatory policies and emerging technologies have become uh, quite uh, relevant nowadays. As a phrase, it can be defined in many possible ways, but typically within research policy journal, at least, there was a, a key definition uh, which re relates emerging technologies as uh, new technologies characterized by radical novelty, relatively fast growth, coherence prominent impact and 
uncertainty. So from self-driving cars uh, to the Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies to the use of nanomaterials, uh, there, there is a, a flooding of new uh, technologies which do afford uh, new business models, uh, new ways to provide uh, services to, to, to clients, uh, to society, but on the other hand, they do pose quite a number of uh, novel dangers and, uh, and hazards. So here are just some um, uh, quick uh, references to, to the media where uh, we provide some evidence uh, of uh, such a sort of issues uh, which may arise uh, from uh, uh, emerging technologies, from uh, crashes uh, out of self-driving cars uh, to frauds uh, or thefts uh, in case of uh, cryptocurrencies uh, to the unknown effects uh, sometimes of, uh, of nano nanoparticles. Uh, public policy issues do arise, and that's what we discuss, we like to discuss uh, in, uh, in our programs. So concerning emerging, emerging technologies, issues like, uh, so what is it precisely that we are to regulate? What are exactly the sort of dangers or hazards that we are going to face? And who should be regulated and how eventually should uh, policies should be, uh, should be framed? Uh, some research I'm carrying out uh, uh, currently has to do with a particular uh, sort of uh, emerging technology, which is the one related to uh, genetic editing. Genetic editing is like the latest uh, version of genetic engineering, uh, which uh, relates uh, to the possibility to modify the, the genes, the genome of living organisms in a much more targeted, efficient, economic way than uh, uh, we could carry out by producing genetically modified organisms in the last couple, couple of decades. Uh, these uh, techniques originates uh, from some discoveries concerning uh, the immunitary system of, uh, of bacteria, but eventually it turned since uh, 2012 into a technique which does allow to uh, produce genetic edits uh, with uh, accurate, uh, accurate precision. In the last uh, less than 10 years, there was, as a consequence, uh, the launch of a number of biotech companies, especially in the US, but also in Europe, which focus on exploitation of such, uh, such techniques, with the prospects uh, to apply in, uh, in a number of areas, uh, from uh, therapies, uh, like for instance, tackling uh, uh, infectious uh, diseases and uh, viruses, diseases like uh, HIV, HIV, the possibility to improve the uh, efficiency and productivity of growing crops or, or food feed uh, and uh, by, by means of uh, enhancing uh, the, uh, the, the performance of, uh, of, uh, of such organism, but up to the possibility to modify the human genome, which is a, a very a slippery slope, the dangerous road, probably would many, many would argue, uh, which uh, also turned into very early attempts to modify the uh, human embryos uh, and apparently one or two experiments uh, which have been carried out uh, in, uh, in China over the last uh, couple of years which triggered uh, needless to say quite a lot of concern uh, in, the, in the areas of uh, bioethics uh, and uh, relatedly more generally to the area of, uh, of public policy. The sort of questions uh, we, we pose uh, within, uh, within the program, within, within the models uh, are precisely uh, is this a public policy issue? What shall we do about it? What are all the consequences of leaving such technology unrestrained in, uh, in, the, in the possible use? Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty attached to it. It's not quite well known, the sort of side effects uh, that genetic edit edits uh, could produce to the very organism, but also to the environment. So for instance, there is the idea to use this technology in order to affect the reproduction of some uh, vehicles uh, of uh, diseases like uh, mosquitoes for malaria, but it's, a, it's, a, it's unclear in the extent to which a genetic edit of mosquitoes could have repercussions on the, on the general environment and to ecosystems. And therefore, there is an uncertainty which does pose a policy concerning how are we going to regulate these technologies. What we like to do also is to observe how diverse the response could be across, across the world. So just uh, for the sake of time, as, as an example, the regulatory response to the, to the rise of CRISPR has been so far quite different in the US with respect Respect to the European Union. In the US, uh, tried and tested a regulatory framework for biotechnologies uh, since the 1980s uh, has been uh, in place, and more recent adjustments uh, have been brought to bear in order to, to tweak it in such a way as to accommodate to the rise of new techniques for changing the DNA of, of organisms. 
In the case of European Union, historically, and therefore there is a legacy from the past and uh, in institutionalist uh, path, uh, there, there has always been a more uh, uh, caution towards uh, a genetic modification as it was incorporated by a GMO directive. And uh, rather than a policy initiative, it was a ruling of the European Court of Justice a couple of years ago to assimilate the more recent uh, techniques for genetic modification to the previous ones. But that's not the end of the story, because from the side of uh, scientists and uh, also industry, there is the claim that uh, contemporary techniques are not quite the same as the previous one, and therefore the uh, ruling of the European Court of Justice uh, is not quite on spot, and instead uh, new regulations uh, should be uh, delivered, uh, designed and delivered uh, in order to better cope uh, with uh, the, the, emerging, uh, the emerging technology. So we face uh, a sort of a dilemma across uh, how to regulate new technologies. In case of CRISPR, on the one hand, we have an extreme, like to ban everything, don't do anything with the DNA of organism. The other extreme could be the one just to allow everything to be tried and tested. And uh, out of a research, development, business initiative, we may hopefully come out with improved productivity and uh, novelty of, of products. But actually, they're in the middle. That's uh, the real concern of public policy, how to design public policies by means of regulatory tools uh, at disposal. And so uh, what we teach, we always uh, refer back and forth in between evidence and theory. And so we look at theory to identify a number of policy tools which have been uh, identified from those which use uh, communication, modality, to those which use authority, those which use money, like subsidies or taxes, so treasure tools, and those uh, which uh, deploy organizations like public sector agencies in order to steer the course of, uh, of a particular policy, policy domain. The point, of course, is the one of how to design precisely the regulations we are going to use and, uh, and on which particular application of these technologies. So we need to map out what this technology could do. So, for example, genetic editing could be used for an intended beneficial effect or a harmful, harmful effect. And the questions are around the externalities of uh, these, the use of this technology. Are externalities going to be beneficial for others at the same time or neutral, indifferent uh, or, or harmful? And here we can map out uh, various prospects for the use of, uh, of a technology from uh, a diagnostic tools, uh, which would be beneficial for everyone. Uh, the very opposite uh, for a bioterrorist attack, which would be something uh, quite uh, detrimental or destructive for, for, for everyone. And then in the middle, there are a number of potential applications. So many of these emerging technologies have the feature to be of dual use, as they are called. So for both civic, but also for military, uh, military purposes. And so from drugs and, and therapies, to gene drive, to genetic sabotage, or even genetic uh, weapons, which may target uh, even particular, uh, particular populations they do pose uh, quite, a, quite a number of issues. So uh, although we may think that the extreme to allow anything to be tried and tested and the other extreme to ban anything uh, could be easily related to the more optimistic and the most pessimistic prospects uh, of the use of the technology, it is really there in the middle gray area, actually it's a yellow area here in the slide where most of the policy issues uh, arise and to understand what could a government really do in order to promote uh, more discoveries around the new technology, but also to steer the development of the technology in the most advantageous way. Of this is about genetic editing, of course, but what we discuss in uh, what we teach relates to other, uh, other technologies. So from applications of the blockchain to the one of artificial intelligence, for instance, or nanotechnologies, there are similar issues here and there. Of course, uh, we do pay attention to, uh, to the global scale. Uh, in implications of such technologies could occasionally uh, produce more leveling field across countries, for instance. Uh, let's think of uh, emerging economies with, which can uh, uh, leapfrog and to embrace uh, digital technologies in a relatively fast way. But other technologies, especially depending on the regimes of uh, patents, uh, for instance, uh, could actually result uh, in advantages uh, to uh, more powerful players uh, already there in the industry, like for instance, 
governments uh, and multinational organizations uh, who can who have uh, more resources uh, to afford uh, to to patent uh, a new a new generation of seeds uh, for instance which may have uh, negative effects uh, to farmers uh, for instance uh, all over the world especially in those countries uh, which rely on the primary sector for for their economy and so we need as a social scientist uh, to anticipate uh, the consequences of these technologies also for societies and, uh, and the economies so I'll stop here and apologize for having been a bit fast, possibly on occasions, but of course the main purpose is just to provide an insight into what we discuss. We try our best to stay on the top of trajectories of development of technologies and tendency in, in society. Of course, I'm happy to take questions concerning the specific, very short mini lecture, which I did. Otherwise, uh, Christine and everyone, I believe uh, we could go back uh, to the more general presentation concerning uh, School of Finance and Management and our programs uh, to conclude that part of the presentation and then to see if there are uh, questions uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you, Alberto. Let's see if there's any short questions on your presentation first, and then we can go to general questions. Has anybody got any questions for Alberto presentations? Fairly uh, engaging and high level stuff, Alberto. So I enjoyed that. But, um, let's see. There's one in the queue. Um, Okay, let's come, come back to that. People can have a chance to think about their question. Um, and let's go to some questions that have appeared in the chat about entrance requirements and also about scholarships that we can cover. So um, in terms of somebody asked, you know, could they, could they uh, um, come and do international business having done an LLB? The answer is yes, provided that you have a, a first or good second class honors bachelor's degree um, you can, and by that we mean it should be equivalent to a, what we call a 2-2 um, bachelor degree in the UK. Um, and we're quite good at matching, you know, don't worry about, you know, we understand how to match qualifications from around the world to the UK qualifications. Relevant work experience can also be um, very helpful and we welcome that. So we would look at that, we look at applications in the round. Um, so we'd look at your educational background, we'd look at your work experience, and if your English is not your mother tongue, then we would look at your um, uh, English language qualifications and we require um, 6.5 in IELTS um, overall, with 6.5 in writing and speaking, and 6 in reading and listening. Um, so that's the entrance requirements. There was a question on scholarships and I've put into the Q&A our pages on scholarships. And actually I could just share that screen if it's helpful for people to, to show you the range of scholarships that are there, or you can just copy that link from the chat. But um, in order to share the screen, Alberto, we would need to stop um, sharing the presentation. So let me see if I can share my screen now. So this is just the scholarships page for talk masters programs from the SOAS website. And I've popped the address for this page into the, um, the web and uh, into the Q&A session and it links to our web pages. So there are scholarships um, for any talk masters program uh, for those from India and also from the following uh, non-India countries, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Palestinian territories, um, these are the Felix scholarships. There's international postgraduate scholarships for any talk master's program East, from East Asia, Japan and Korea, Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, Americas, Middle East, Africa and Europe. And then there's a number of more specialized scholarships. So I just leave that there for you to look at on our web page and um, we can, you can email either Alberto and I if you have any further questions. Um, and you'll find us on the School of Finance and Management um, webpage. So I'll stop showing my screen there. Um, are there any other questions that people have about the programs, about scholarships, applications, entrance requirements? 
Christine, you may notice there is a question uh, which uh, says, uh, can you say a bit more about how to go about finding a supervisor is, if one is interested in pursuing a research degree? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So the, the best thing to do is to go to um, our website again. And um, let me just, um, maybe I'll show my screen again. Let me just find the right page before I do it. <laughs> Um, so this is the um, home page of the School of Finance and Management and I reached this page on the SAS website by clicking on this departments tab at the top and there you'll see all the departments of SAS listed and I went to School of Finance and Management and clicked on it and I ended up here. If you go to this staff button, this is the faculty, you'll see that all of us are listed here with a little bit about our research interests. So I'm there and my research interest is industrial organisation, policy, innovation, sustainable development and corporate governance. And I also do work on the governance of professional sports leagues, um, which is a rather niche area. But I suppose my main area is innovation and regional differences in innovation activity across firms. But you can find um, so, you know, Alberto is here. You can find um, everyone's research interests in the department. And so if you're thinking of doing a PhD in a particular area, um, just drop us an email. So it's got all of our email addresses there. Drop us an email, say, I'm thinking of doing a PhD in this area. The more information you can give, the better. The, the more idea you have about your research proposal, the better. I often get sent research proposals to comment on and um, that's really the best way to go around finding a supervisor and just you know, don't be afraid to talk to us. Um, it is a little bit tricky to phone. These phone numbers you'll find won't work at the moment because we're under lockdown at the moment and we're all working from home. So email is the best way to contact us and then we can speak by phone or Zoom or Skype or whatever once you've made the initial contact by email. Um, I hope that answers that question. Um, and on that, please, another question I'm going to read out. Um, English language proficiency is usually a setback for most of us coming from uh, English language speaking countries, um, of which our language instruction is English, but we still must go through the English. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Now, I have to say that um, we on the academic side, don't deal with the language requirements at SOAS. Um, but if, I don't know the answer to that, to your question, I suppose, is, is it the case? Maggie, do you know the answer? Yes, I know. C can you hear me? So basically, um, what we do, there is a list, if you, if you go to our website with English language requirements, you will see that we've recently updated our requirements and we are now um we, we we can consider you know um making students self exempt or ielts exempt if they studied in an english majority speaking country or if their university's language of instruction was english so again you will need to uh, my advice would be if your program was taught was delivered in english uh, you will just need to provide a statement. You will need to send it to our to our English assessor, and then uh, they will they will be able to make a decision whether you actually need to take an English test or not. And I know that in Africa we have a list of universities uh, with uh, English um, medium of instruction, so English language. And I know that we um, we would no longer ask students to take an IELTS test. So again. I don't know what your situation is. You mentioned that you're from Cameroon, but again, uh, if you'd like to receive more information, uh, feel free to, to, to contact our, our admissions. So it's not that you will need to take an, an English test. We just need to, you know, assess, our admissions need to assess your application. I was going to say that the language requirements are dealt with separately from the London.
let me ask you, and you can put it in the Q&A or answer, what programs are you interested in? And uh, on which countries are you from? I'm quite curious, we're here in London, but where are you? And uh, what's your home country? We've got someone interested in international business, somebody interested in um, public policy management. Um, any other questions? No? And if you if you don't have any other questions, I don't know, Alberto, whether you want to add anything um, that we think we should we should cover now. Well, not not quite. Uh, if not, possibly uh, just uh, to share with the uh, uh, perspective of students uh, that we always uh, uh, keep uh, in contact with our past students, especially uh, after being a student at SOAS, uh, you join a community of uh, of our alumni. And uh, in our uh, programs, we tend uh, to keep these communities uh, quite lively and uh, to help uh, uh, people form networks. So, for instance, uh, uh, since uh, years ago, I cultivate a group on LinkedIn of uh, former students of the MSc Public Policy, Finance uh, and Management, and uh, therefore we can uh, track their trajectories. And so I can, uh, I can see uh, the positions uh, they can uh, take in, in government, uh, in consulting, uh, in, uh, in the third sector in uh, NGOs uh, in many different uh, different countries. This is also uh, an interesting opportunity to get some feedback about the tendencies uh, of uh, what is uh, required uh, in the job market. And for example, some of the last tendencies uh, is uh, apparently a growing importance, uh, perceived importance uh, uh, towards uh, uh, data, data science, data analysis. And therefore, right uh, in these very days, together with uh, Christine under the leadership of Christine, we are reviewing uh, programs for the future, but already since, uh, since the next year, we are going to introduce uh, uh, in programs like public policy, finance and management, and more attention towards uh, the importance of data and provision of evidence, which does inform evidence-based policy making and uh, greater use of uh, digital technologies. And I believe that that's a, a general trend that also in other, in other programs uh, is, uh, is more and more embedded. I believe, Christine, in the meanwhile, there are a couple of more uh, uh, inputs uh, in the Q&A Q section. Mm. So a follow-up question to the PhD one, you know, should I, my interest in development finance, so School of Finance is a good fit, but what about the, the, the Department of Development and the of Studies and the Department of Economics? Well, I mean, it's the same thing. If you go to that Departments tab on the SOAS homepage, you can find the Department of Development Studies and look at the staff there and see those, there are some staff there working in finance, some of our colleagues across departments. And also in the Department of Economics, you'll find staff working in finance. So just have a look at the staff interests and see where you think your research project fits best. And talk to email, you can email more than one person, that's okay, I mean, don't go, um, I mean, try, try and keep it fairly focused. Try and think about what you really want to do and find the best match for your research topic. And I guess the differences between us as a department is we're probably a little bit more um, um, methods, maybe a bit more methods focused in our department um, on finance and so on and public policy, but that's, the, the differences are quite nuanced between the departments. I mean, obviously development is more focused on development finance, um, economics and what more on the economics of finance and we're much more on finance and financial management including financial management in the public sector in the school of finance and management but I think the key thing for a PhD is your supervisor and your research topic so you've got to find a supervisor that matches your research topic so that's how I would search and then a, a follow-up question um, on a full scholarship I'm from the Cameroon, you need a full scholarship, we understand that. Have a look at the scholarships page and then probably best to contact us in the School of Finance and Management to have a chat about that. Um, 
once you've found a suitable scholarship and um, I wouldn't let that, I wouldn't let applying for the scholarship delay you applying for the programme. Um, you do need to have an offer of a place on the programme um, and then apply for the scholarship as well. And then I'm trying to work, um, I'm trying to work in that light while hoping to be one of the SOAS students one of these days. Uh, that's, that's great to hear and we would uh, like to have you at SOAS. Um, so yeah, please do contact us if you have any further questions. Is there anything else that anyone wants to raise? I and mean, the other thing I would just say that maybe um, you know, hasn't come through is, is something I said early on. We are quite sort of challenge focused at SOAS, you know, there are kind of big challenges in the world at the moment. Um, uh, you know, COVID is one of them, obviously, but also climate change and migration, climate change related migration. These issues are very much of a concern to SOAS. So we do want to study and we do study those topics and try and um, uh, contribute to solving those challenges. And that may not be so obvious from our course titles when you look at them, but the content is there on climate, on climate change and addressing climate change and how we can do that. I mean, Alberto touched on some of it in some of the issues in his um, Taster lecture on, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily, it's great to have that lecture because you wouldn't necessarily think all those topics are covered in public policy and financial management, but they are. So we do take on board these broad challenges that we face as a society. Any other questions? We've answered them all. Alberto, would you like to add anything before we close? Not quite, if not just my thanks uh, to those who, who attended the session and uh, to those who will uh, watch or listen it. And, uh, looking forward to seeing you at SOAS, uh, hopefully in presence, uh, when the conditions of the pandemic uh, get better all over the world. And Maggie, would you like to add anything before we close the session? I, I just would like to thank you um, for, for presenting today. Again, if um, any of our participants um, have questions, what you can do, you can uh, email uh, Christine or email Alberto, reach out to them and ask more questions. We have a student ambassador with us today. And again, I'm not sure if there are any questions about, for example, student life. If yes, you can, you can ask uh, Khadija uh, and, and she'll be happy to, to answer them. Uh, oh. Yeah, and I think we will, yeah, it's time for us to, to finish the session. Once again, thank you very much.